You know, uh, I just come to the realization that this song makes way less sense if I'm not doing a morning show. Like, if I'm doing an afternoon show, I should probably have a different theme song. But, what the hell? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jury Saturday. My name is Justin Robert Young. Uh, and we got a bunch of uh, stuff to talk about, okay? Um, I have two stories. I have two personal stories uh, that I would like to tell you guys about before we get into all the politics, which we will talk about. It was a very, very, very big week in politics in what has been an otherwise fairly annoying campaign. I, I would say from both uh, from both sides, there's been... I mean, obviously, well, we'll get into it. Let me tell you a story. Um, I wanted to go see, on my friend Andrew Maine's recommendation, The Master. The Master is a Paul Thomas Anderson film. It stars Philip Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix. My phone's going off. Um, so I'll talk about my phone, too. That's part of my other story. <clears throat> Stars Philip Seymour Hoffman, and it's it's uh, something that I've looked forward to. But I kind of have a love hate relationship with Paul Thomas Anderson movies because I really like Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights is great. I I enjoy the following films: Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love, There Will Be Blood. Uh, I like it. Um, but you know, if you were to put a gun to my head and say Justin Young sign a piece of paper that says Paul Thomas Anderson is overrated, I would sign the paper. I don't want to go out there and say it. I don't want to be the Paul Thomas Anderson is overrated guy, but I tend to find that his films are, are if not overrated, overpraised. That people kind of like uh, a lot about them that I don't see. They might see, I don't see. So Andrew calls me and says that the master's great, awesome, amazing, like really must see stuff. His favorite uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movie. So I go, and <clears throat> part of the reason why I really want to go is because I've heard from a lot of people, a lot of reviewers have said that there are some limited engagements now and have been for the two weeks since the movie's been in theaters. That there are some theaters that are running it in seventy millimeter. Now. If I just said that, and you heard in your own head, hooray, 70 millimeter, I'm excited about that, then we have something in common. What we might not have in common is what the fuck that means. I know most films are normally shown in 35 millimeter. Uh, I, I, this is double, more, bigger. Greater, higher resolution, I assume. Listen, I don't know. I don't know, okay? Because I know that it's in the same theater that a 35 millimeter print would be shown. And specifically, I guess, it's not to say that I don't wrap my head around it. It's just that I don't know exactly what that means for me visually. Okay? Uh, I, I don't. But I was excited by it. It might as well have been Excellento Vision. The Master, coming to the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, California, now in Excellento Vision. And Excellento Vision would have, like, a stereotypical Italian, like, It's Excellento! Um, but I'm excited. I want to go see it, and I want to go see it at that theater because it has 70 millimeter, and I walk by it every once in a while, and it says, like, only place in Northern California that you can see the master in 70 millimeter. Um, all right. So I walk down there. I'm going to see the movie, and I'm, like, kind of jacked about seeing the movie and specifically seeing it in 70 millimeter. I get to the theater. I walk in, I buy my ticket, and I'm like, hey, 70 millimeter, right? And the lady's like, no, it's in the smaller theater. And I'm like, what? wait, okay, why, like, 
At this point, I'm blaming me. My my number one default is always to blame myself. It's always my fault. Because that's what you do when you are a self-loathing person, is that you immediately find the way that it's your fault. So I, I say to her, oh, crap, did I miss it? Did I... Was it only for like the previous two weeks? Mind you, this is a Thursday. And she's like, no, 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 tomorrow, a.k.a. Friday, which would theoretically be the beginning of a, yet another movie week, it's back in the main theater in 70 millimeter. So I'm like, whoa. Buh? But why, for now... Is it not in that theater? And I come to find out that it's because there was a genetically modified foods documentary that is apparently part and parcel with a current political campaign locally to label genetically modified foods. Now, real quick capsule. If this were a textbook, this would be a breakout box on my feelings on genetically modified foods. We've talked a lot about on the Weird Things podcast. If you listen to the Weird Things podcast, we've talked about it. I think they're great. I think that they have done more for uh, feeding people around the world and making the world itself a better place than anything else. It, 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 it's made more people healthier. Their cause is to put a label on genetically modified foods. Have it legally mandated that you have to put a label on genetically modified foods. Which many who produce foods that have genetic modifications think that it's going to be a, a uh, kiss of death. Scarlet letter. And I don't disagree with them. But... No matter where you are on that cause, no matter where you sit on the political spectrum on that cause, how about you put a fucking label on ruining my goddamn night because you have to have your shitty fucking doc played in the big theater where I'm going to go see the 70 millimeter print of the fucking master. Why can't you have your shitty genetically modified thing at another theater? No. Because they want maximum possibilities. Everybody to come in and jerk each other off on this fucking genetic modified foods thing. Ugh. Blech. Blech. God, I was so fucking angry. And I was with a friend of mine who's platonic. And I was just fucking going on and like getting loud about how angry I was. And she was just like, just stop doing it. You're going to embarrass me. So I stopped. And I watched the movie. Good news is, the movie's great. The movie's fantastic. I heard two things that I would like to refute uh, from a, a, not only friends, uh, but also critics about this movie. Um, I heard that A, there's not much plot, and B, that it's not really about Scientology. If you don't know about the, 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 the plot of the movie, it's about a character who seems an awful lot like L. Ron Hubbard. And he's created this movement, no one ever says religion, uh, called The Cause, which seems a lot like Scientology. Um, and it's really a character study of him interacting with a wayward drifter and war veteran in Joaquin Phoenix. It's a fantastic movie. But to the two points, that there's no plot. I think there is a plot. It's a simple plot. It's not a very complex plot. There's not a whole lot of <clears throat> twists and turns, per se. But there certainly is a plot. And uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was a very good one. And, and it was an uncluttered narrative that really stood to showcase the acting in the film, which is superb. It's fantastic. You know, there is a great portrait. I'm not spoiling much to say that... Uh, that there's a portrayal by Joaquin Phoenix of a chemically dependent alcoholic. And I say chemically dependent to illustrate it from social or functional. He is a person 
who has his life on a very daily basis, very literally ruled by his consumption of alcohol. Uh, so it's it's fantastic. If you just had a movie about that guy, I'd be interested to combine it with a movie uh, about this kind of super cult of personality, which is the other element that I wanted to talk about. People were saying it's not really about Scientology. Uh, yeah, it's not a biopic. It's not an L. Ron Hubbard biopic. And it's not like, you know... Like if you do fuck it all like you know all the it's not like like a, like the Ray Charles biopic where it's like like oh I don't know I think I'm gonna come up with a song you got the right one honey oh no like um it, it's not like that it's uh it's about a person that does start a movement like this. And there's so many just great scenes. I don't want to spoil things, although I don't know if I really could because so much of it is just watching these people up there. But go see it. If you're skeptical about Paul Thomas Anderson movies, like I am, then I suggest you go see it. And for a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, whoo, slim at a, at a, a trim 130 minutes. Man, that dude's movies normally top out closer to three. So check that one out. That's the master. I have one other story about me being a total retard. I'm going to pause and take this drink of coffee while I think about it. I like Apple products. I like, uh, I'm talking to you right now on a MacBook I own a new iPad, the new iPad, not the iPad 3. I have an iPhone 4S, and a couple days after orders began on the iPhone 5, I was talked into buying one and selling my 4S on Gazelle. Gazelle.com slash twit. If you would like, or enter twit at checkout. So, I got the iPhone 5, and because it's been a very, very popular device, I got slapped with a two- to three-week delay on getting it. So I waited. Not patiently at all. In fact, I, I was very bad at waiting. I went to the Apple store, and I tried to buy one so I could cancel it. Uh, that was unsuccessful, so I went back the next day. And I tried to buy it, and I, I waited for them to open, and that was not successful. So I talked to the guy, and he's like, listen, you getting the size, color, and carrier that you want on an average day, a random average day, and somebody else not getting it first and it not being sold because there's like a buy it online to pick it up in the store option? Not going to happen. I mean, like, it might happen. You can keep doing this like a fucking idiot, but uh, unlikely to happen. So I waited it out. And uh, eventually I got a notice saying that it was coming my way, and I was very, very happy. It was going to come Thursday. So I go and check to see when uh, it would arrive and where specifically in transit it was using the tracking feature, only for me to find out that it had already arrived. Ooh. Imagine my excitement. Imagine my excitement that waiting just down below, out in front uh, of, of my mailbox, could in fact be my iPhone 5. Oh, oh, the heavenly rapture. Just the electric feeling of delight as it coursed through my veins. Only to come crashing down. As I realized that it had, in fact, arrived at my mother's house in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which, to those of you who are not great at geography, is not near where I live in Oakland, California. Now, there's been a couple times over the last couple weeks that I have, uh, I have really... Uh, kind of come at my mom uh, really hard about a technology thing that she knows nothing about. Once was with HBO Go. A couple weeks ago, I just randomly started, uh, like, just text spamming her and being like, sign up for HBO Go. 
Here's a here's a URL. Do it. She's like, well, I don't know. What is it? Uh, how much money does it cost? Just do it, mother. God damn it. She signed up for it, and she, like, emailed me like it was an urgent thing. She's like, I did it. I did it. What do you want me to do? And I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. I just want to watch HBO shows, and you're not going to use it. So, there. There we go. Um, I didn't really yell at my mom. I, I just kind of, like, put a little bug in her ear, and she thought it was something urgent. This was urgent. This was not HBO Go. This was for real. I wanted my goddamn iPhone 5. I told her, listen, put this little bugger in the post. Fast as she's going to come to Oakland. I don't care the price. Spared no expense, as they say in Jurassic Park. And so I finally get it today. I mean, th- th- this one isn't really, you know, there's not much of a story on it beyond that I'm a big fat idiot for fucking sending my iPhone 5 to my mom's house. Which, by the way, by the way, I also did with my 4S. Except then I lived in Tamarack. I lived about 15 minutes away from my mom. So I was just waiting like a fucking card at my house in Tamarack for the phone to arrive. And meanwhile, I'd been sitting at my mom's house. So uh, I guess the real moral of this wayward tale is I need to change the fucking default address on my Apple account. Also, silly dilly dokio, I'm an idiot. Speaking of idiots, let's talk about politics. Politics, 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 politics. Yes. Gal is like a racehorse. I play her to win. Woo! Doggy. Big week. Big week, ladies and germs. I said at the beginning of the show that this has been a fairly annoying campaign on both sides, and I do mean it. I, I think that... Uh, you probably, and it continued to be an annoying campaign for one side uh, this week, and it was a, a, a better campaign for another. Let's start at the beginning of the week. Uh, I haven't talked politics for a little bit because uh, I mean I had my brother here, so we talked a little bit more kind of uh, abstractly about the political race. Um, and then actually we did the show last week and we talked about Doctor Who, so not a lot about politics. Here's where we were at the beginning of last week. I I don't particularly subscribe to the narrative that things were done, uh, which was kind of what people were talking about at the beginning of last week. Uh, there was a lot of, this is Romney's last best chance um, to, to turn the race around. And I don't quite know that. Um, you know, I tend to think that debates are very boring affairs, that both candidates tend to play not to lose, and, uh, you know, that it's not a real not a real game changer, that we tend to romanticize them, because it is just a great American tradition, you know, the two dudes yelling at each other. Not to say that that is a uniquely American thing, but it is woven into the American fiber. We, we, we lionize the the presidents that have done it well. And we remember the moments that come out of it. Because very rarely do you get a chance to see these guys off message, you know. And not to say that that debates are off message, but they can be. It's a live mic, you know. Anything can happen. Someone could fart really loud. Have we ever heard that? Has anybody farted? Man, I'll tell you, I would love to interview every single president that's ever debated and say, have you farted? On stage during a debate. Whew. That'd be great. That would be, oh man. Who would be the most likely to fart? I mean, because you're nervous. I was talking to Brett about this. Is there any more high pressure situation than doing a debate? Like everything else that you do, even as president, you can craft a statement. State of the unions are, are speeches, right? This is you talking back and forth. As much as you want to stay on talking points, like the, the first debate, which is always watched by more than all the other ones, this is big shit, man. Like, I don't know if there's any more high-pressure situations. And I'm curious in the chat room if you guys can think of anything or if you guys disagree with me. Because this is the, the, the job, the most powerful job in the world, 
You can do whatever you want when you're president. But you can change the course of history. You are literally a superhero. So meanwhile, and by the way, only thing better than the idea of somebody farting on stage during a presidential debate is the other guy calling him on it. Or the debate moderator. Oh my God. People were so far up Jim Lehrer's ass for what a bad job he did. Imagine if he had been like, Mr. President, did you fart? That'd be great. Oh, now I can't... All right, I'll stop talking about this because I'll... I'll the one person I think who could fart and own it would be Clinton. Clinton would fart. Clinton, I'll tell you what, during that three-man debate, the, the, the Perot-Bush-Clinton debate, I bet you Bill Clinton let out a silent but deadly fart and then just smirked. Like, that would be like a way he would get in the other guy's head. The other guy, Ross Perot, would be fucking doing his, like, well, now you see what you got to really do is look at, I'll tell you what, I go to the best country in the world and I take their foreign policy. That's what I do. Ugh. And, like, he choked on it, and then Clinton would just look over and be like, came out of my butt. Huh. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, let's talk about what was at stake. I don't think that Romney needed uh, to have a, a big thing. There's a lot of time left, and this is a very close election, no matter what anybody wants to tell you. We're getting closer and closer to judgment time. And so uh, I would say what Obama's uh, campaign and supporters said before that this was out of reach is not uh, is probably overblown. And now that you're seeing kind of the polls bounce in the other direction, I don't think that the bounce is going to be as dramatic as uh, as as people say it, it's gonna it's gonna be close. It's gonna be very close. It's gonna be extraordinarily close. So, uh, no matter what, the fundamentals of the election are are there. And and I I do think that this is an in intensely important debate. But no matter what, it was gonna be a a real squeaker. But the narrative going in was that Romney was fucking up. A lot of people were just you know just looking at Romney and. Said like, dude, you, you fucked up. You could have done X. You could have done Y. You haven't done either. You haven't particularly, you know, made yourself likable. Uh, you know, if you look at polling, he had lost um, trust on the economy, which he kind of needs to have. There were some troubling polls coming out of Ohio specifically. So. You know, there was it was it was not sunny for him. He had more to gain, I guess. Now, let's rewind a little bit on both President Obama and candidate Romney's debate experience, which is not good. Either of them are particularly good debaters. Uh, Romney always looked kind of out of place during the big scrum GOP debates. Uh, he's not an applause line guy. Like, he very rarely, uh, in those kind of debates, Newt Gingrich will say shit like, like, I will make gas five cents because I am fat. Ah! And everybody freaks out. Or fucking, you know, like, Ron Paul will fucking say, like, ah, gold standard. Ah! And then he fucking does four push-ups and all the Ron Paul people just fucking, like, rip off their shirts and start rubbing their titties together. Um, you know, like, Romney, he's not that guy. He's he's not the, uh, the big, I'm going to say something extraordinarily popular and everyone's going to, to do jumping jacks during the GOP debates where, you're, where people are allowed to be loud. I think he's more comfortable in, the, in this kind of debate, which he has not done a lot of. So, um, that being said, he's not good. Uh, you know, he, he's not a particularly great debater. Obama has always secretly kind of been a terrible debater. Uh, and this has been something that if you watch his debates with Hillary, he, he has a, a tendency to kind of come off smug. Even with John McCain, uh, they, they were not knockout debates. They were boring debates. They were very, very... Um, they were very, uh, you know, play not to lose. They kind of just went on their, uh, on their talking points. But at that point, 
everybody just had Obama fever, uh, and it didn't matter. Now, what happened on Tuesday? Well, let me tell you what doesn't matter. What doesn't matter is that either candidate lied. Let me tell you that. If you were out there the next day talking about how much the other guy lied, you fucked up. Your team fucked up. Was it Tuesday or Wednesday? Whatever. This week. Whatever the debates were. Uh, what happened? I'll tell you what. It's, you know, the, it doesn't matter what what Romney said. It doesn't. Unless he said something so ridiculous uh, that, that, you know, like fact check wise, like the sky was green, doesn't matter. Because people watching change their opinions on Romney because he looked like a human being. He didn't look like a tin marionette clanking his way through a speech. He looked like a guy that could be president. And that is so important. And what people don't realize is, is, you know, listen, if you are a partisan on either side of this, just appreciate that there is a great benefit to being shown to be someone that seems like he can handle the office. This is what killed Palin. Palin can do the shit that we ask people to do, and specifically, let's say, a Republican candidate. A popular Republican candidate is meant needs to smile and hold their own with combative interviews. She couldn't. She fucked up. You're not supposed to wink during debates like she did, <laughs> which was amazing. That debate is still one of my favorite. Palin, Biden, oh, I don't know if there's ever going to be. F- there are cartoons that have more substantive uh, dignity than the Palin-Biden debate four years ago. I almost, I might watch it again. It's actually great. Anyway. Okay, this is a really great point. Uh, Mikko Pelk says in the chat room, yes, but do you really want a president who is a known and consistent liar? Why do you think we we are every president's a known and consistent liar? It's politics. It's this is what it is. Like we every political person shapes the truth to what they want it to be. This is what the game is. You play to win the game. That's why you play it and you do it. I will I will assign them the most noble intentions. They believe that this is too important to not get done. They will do what they have to to get into office because they believe in the public service. And that's the most noble intention. The least noble intentions are that they're sociopaths and they want to continue to ascend on the scale of power until there is nowhere else to go but north. Uh, Okay. I don't know what happened with Obama. I, I, I really, really, really don't know um, what he was doing. I know that it, it wasn't good. I didn't know that it was bad. And you know it was bad because they immediately changed the tone of their campaign the next day. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's interesting to see, or it will be interesting to see, where we go from here. Because what we saw the next day was, let's hold Mitt Romney to the facts. Which, when, the, when both sides are calling each other liars, it's hard to make a, a, a fact-based argument. Just rhetorically. Because... The other side has been like, well, they've lied about everything. They're lying about this. Look at the facts. Uh, you know, so 
I, I don't know how effective that is beyond rallying the base, which I think was really – there's two problems. There's the – there's actually – all right, three fallouts from the debate. There's Romney bettering his image. There's Obama not bettering his image. And then there's the erosion of base support and – uh, the idea that maybe they fucked up. So the reason why that you can see that that third thing exists is watch MSNBC. Watch liberal outlets and how they reacted to Obama's performance, which their their criticism was far more that he didn't hold him to the facts he didn't say things were untrue. He uh, didn't bring up things like the 47% tape. Um, you know, that, that that erodes confidence. And, and that is maybe the most damaging element. The most troubling element of their campaign should be that now Mitt Romney looks like a human. The most damaging element is that they're is that rank and file people now look at the campaign even just slightly differently like whoa you guys normally nail this and you didn't why didn't you what's happening um Dan Wally all right so let's see what what has happened thus far we've had a few rolling tracking polls now if you don't know how rolling tracking polls work this is what happens you got certain people, Rasmussen's one of them, that call people every day and talk to them. And then they average the rolling polls on like a three or four day window. You have seen the latest Rasmussen tracking poll has Romney up by two points. He had consistently been uh, behind by two or three pre-debates with 75% of the polling being done after the debates. So we'll see what happens further out. But the the issue is not the debates. The issue is the coverage around the debates. That's what lasts. The debates last a tiny amount of time. People talking about it and the fact that it was not looked at as a draw with Romney kind of winning, but a a huge booming failure by Obama slash win by Romney, that's what's driving the narrative. Now, um, and, and what will be interesting to look at is uh, what the rolling uh, aggregates are on, on stuff like uh, Real Clear Politics, which, which takes all the polling and, and puts it together. Polling, of course, is inaccurate. Like, you know, it's, it's an imperfect science. Nobody really knows. And like I said before, it's, it's going to be close. So no matter what, when we can obsess about who's two or three points on, on either side, but it's going to be really fucking close. And if you didn't think it was going to be really fucking close, then it's going to be really fucking close. Just get it through your heads. It's going to be a squeaker. No matter what happens from here till then, it's going to be... Really, 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 really close. Okay. Um, so, Friday, we get good news for Obama. The unemployment rate, which has consistently been over 8%, goes down to 78 Now, like I said before, if you are out the next day after a shitty debate performance, pointing across the, the aisle and saying, you lied, you've lost. That is consist that's an action of a side that lost. In the same capacity, if you are on the opposite side of a low unemployment number and you are pointing across the aisle and saying that you cooked the books and these are not real, doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Most people don't fucking understand how we get this number. They just know that it's a number that is relative to whether or not we're doing a good job. It's a measurable element 
of a president's work. Um, so Jack Welch came out and said very specifically <laughs> that he thought that this was a deliberate attempt by the Obama campaign to blunt the fact that he shit the bed at the debates. Uh, the first two questions uh, during the press conference where the numbers were announced uh, were from journalists asking whether or not these numbers were accurate, to which uh, I forget what the name of the secretary is. Got really testy about it. So, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Really, the the question is, whether this is a story that outlasts the debates. Because it seems like even now, people are still talking about the debates more so than the jobs numbers, which is not good for Obama. But we'll see on Monday. If on Monday people are talking about the jobs numbers, then that's great. Uh, if they're if they're not, I mean, which, which kind of, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess there's a schedule for stuff like this, but like, you know. If you were Obama, you'd want the jobs numbers to be talked about on Monday, not Friday. Because, I mean, like, at least these jobs numbers. Normally jobs numbers, put them on Friday. <laughs> if jobs, if, if unemployment's still over eight, I don't know. Uh, how about 5.01 on Friday, we put out a note on, you know, on, on the corner of uh, some avenue in Washington, and somebody can pick it up and look at it. Um, so... That's where we are. What do we want to watch for? We want to watch polling in Florida, Ohio, and Virginia. There's a lot of other states that can come into play, but those three states are most likely going to be what will change the election. Uh, and specifically, uh, I forget, I don't know the counties in Ohio, but um, you're looking at Orange County in Florida, Pinellas County in Florida, what we call the I-4 corridor, that's Orlando and Tampa. Those are very, very important. And uh, in Virginia, you're looking at the Virginia Beach area, specifically the areas where there uh, are high working class black populations because that's where Obama overachieved historically in 08. If he can repeat that, he is in a good position. If Romney can win Virginia because that specific area um, does not come out as much as they did in 08, that will be a boon for him. Uh, so so there we go. We will We will see... Um, Mikko Pelk, uh, where are those states trending towards in the latest polling? Uh, Romney was there, like I said before, for the debates, there were some troubling polls coming out of Ohio. Um, there is information, again, depending on who you trust with polling, uh, there's, there's now more favorable information in all, in all three of those states for Romney. But of course, that's right after the debate. So, We'll see where that is in a week. We'll see where that is, uh, you know, going going forward. Um. So yeah, I mean, this is this is all. This is all about uh, about the game, you know. It's, it's politics. The game is the game. One last thing. I said on Twitter during the Democratic National Convention, I don't know whether or not I said it on here, but when Bill Clinton came out and did his fucking four-hour jam band solo, uh, and everybody was just like fucking spraying champagne on each other and fucking making out and... You know, like, you know, everyone was just going crazy. David Axelrod was fucking doing coke off Kesha's tits. And, like, there was just all sorts of crazy madness. And, like, Hillary Clinton was just greasing up, like, ready to mud wrestle somebody. Whenever, when that happened, and everybody was doing a backflip, 
I said, because I, I, I firmly believe from what I've read, I don't think Bill Clinton likes Barack Obama, personally. And I'll tell you this, I don't think it's anything to do, except for the fact that Barack Obama is, is apparently a fairly closed person who doesn't talk to a lot of people. Bill Clinton's a talking guy. Bill Clinton became good friends with fucking George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush. Like, because they like talking to him. He likes being asked his opinion. Barack apparently doesn't do that. Um, I thought that that was a good thing for the moment. People love Billy. Wasn't necessarily a great thing for Barack. And that the next day when he came out and gave his speech, that people would say, good, not Bill Clinton, but good. Um, I saw, after the debates, the idea that Bill Clinton wouldn't have lost this debate. Now, I don't think that there's anybody who would argue that. But, like, there is a sense, specifically since the DNC, that maybe, you know, is Barack Clinton? And should that, should people even be thinking about that? I don't know. Um, so there we go. All right. Uh, that is the uh, political section of the jury Saturday. Um, the, the 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 jury Saturday program.